Oh God, seeing clearly that which you purposed us to be. And allowing every part of our lives of God to be transformed, transfigured. In every way, oh God, conform to the image. Father, I pray in the name of Jesus. Lord, you, you alone can break the hardest hearts of strongholds. And we know, Lord God, the greatest strongholds are the strongholds of religion. Oh God, we know that the greatest stronghold is to believe that you're right when in reality you're wrong and living wrong and doing wrong, being wrong. For that light which is in us be darkness, so how great is that darkness? So Father, we pray tonight, today and tonight, in the mighty name of Jesus, that every heart would be yielded to you to see those things that you desire to reveal. Hallelujah. And then we just respond to you in simple submission and obedience and turn our lives completely over to you and say from this day forward, oh God, with all of my heart, I submit myself to you. Holy Spirit, take control of my life, room over me. I'm not going to allow the things I've allowed in the past. I'm not going to allow, I'm not going to allow the, the condition of life, the manner of life that is not contrary to the ways of the Holy Ghost to exist in my life. I'm not going to allow anything that doesn't look like joy, that doesn't look like peace, that doesn't look like love. Uh, that doesn't look like humility, that doesn't look like grace, doesn't look like speaking your word continually. Lord, uh, Ramambate. Father, I pray today in the name of Jesus that your people would commit themselves to not letting the, the words of this law, this law of life, the law of the life of the Spirit, is in Christ Jesus. I pray, Father, that they would not let these words depart out of their mouth, but they continually speak them. To speak them. Hallelujah. Praise God. Speaking the word. So, Father, we pray in the name of Jesus that every person who's lived their life speaking other words, speaking their complaints, speaking a life about things that they have in concern for, for their own self-interest, come to an end. Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Father, men, men will not say tomorrow, but they rather say today. In Jesus' name. <laughs> God, that they put everything in today, not tomorrow, not waiting for some, <laughs> some breakthrough financially, some breakthrough spiritually, some breakthrough physically, but if they, whatever the state they're in, they were paralyzed from the waist down. They dragged themselves around by their hands to do thy will, God. <laughs> they had no wheelchair, no crutches. They just dragged themselves around by their hands. There'd be no excuses, no waiting for something to happen before they move. Oh, Rebasta, get it in me. Father, we pray that in Jesus' name that every person would recognize if that is the case, then they made themselves the master and you the servant. Oh, God, we pray in Jesus' name. Ha! Ah, in Jesus' name. Every foul spirit of hell, every power of darkness, I bind you, Satan. I destroy you, work, you lying thing. Try to set up residence in the hearts of God's people. Try to bring back into bondage those who are completely set free. Snare them once again with your deceit in your life. I break off your authority, stronghold now. So that each person have the right to see and have the right to choose. Father, we thank you for working a work in our lives so that your people will not be so overwhelmed with the care of this life, having to work hard, so hard every day, care of this life, that they don't have any time to serve you. Father, we pray you turn that thing around in Jesus' name. Turn that thing around now in the name of Jesus. Father, we pray that every person's job be turned into a mission field. Hallelujah. Father, we pray that more people be able to step out in faith and live by faith. Go full time helping out in the school of evangelism. Full time helping out in the school of missions. Full time in the master better day. Lamanda begs to be. Sweetheart, take your shoes. Just surrender your heart to Jesus. Just submit your heart to Jesus. Don't hold on to anything. You're sitting, you're standing in his presence and he loves you so much. He'll forgive you of anything, but you've got to ask for it. Huh? He'll erase the past and remove off the stronghold, but you've got to be willing to follow him. All you got to do is just talk to him. Hallelujah. All you got to do is begin to mess to Love any. I'm here leading you right now. You know what? 
People want to make the ministry their peers. Let me tell you something. You can't ever receive much from your peers. And especially in the kingdom of God, you don't receive anything from your peers. Nothing. But when you bring an, when you recognize ministry and you honor a ministry as something that belongs to the kingdom of God and of God, then you might get something. Should you connect. Now, rebellious age don't want to hear nothing about that. Defiance and opposite, and, you know, pride of life. Wants to make everybody, you know, on equal standing. But not. I mean, we're equal in oneness with him. You understand what I'm saying there? Because there's an equality there. You understand that? And there's an equality there out of oneness. But there is still, still, Christ Jesus is going to be Christ Jesus, God forever. His ministry is going to be over his church. That's the way it works. Yeah. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Praise God. <laughs> and people don't understand this, but Father is over Christ Jesus. Yeah. People don't understand it, no one recognizes it. You know? And what we want you to be able to do is we want you to stop recognizing stuff from a mental point of view and, and affirmation with your words and your amens. Once you understand it after the heart and start doing your amens by the deed, because that's what Papa wants. Papa's not interested in vocalizations so much. Are you with me? He's interested in the heart. That's why you can stand here today and just go, ah, Lord, you know, sound like a crow con, you know. And if it comes from your heart, the Lord's just getting magnified and being glorified and being blessed and being honored. Oh, God, you don't know the words? Just, just hallelujah, praise God, thank you, Jesus. Not knowing the words is not, in, it, let me just help you understand something. If you don't know the words to the song we're singing, doesn't excuse you from worshiping God. Uh, you understand? And it shouldn't be an excuse. Because <laughs> the bottom line is, the Lord said, sing a new song. Now, we don't want you to sing a nuisance song, you know, where you're disturbing somebody. But if it's, if it's giving praise and honor to the Lord, and it's in the midst of the shout, here's what's wrong. Here's what's wrong. Here's what's wrong. If you're downcast while the worship's going on, you look like Cain. He was downcast. And the Lord said, why is your countenance fallen? Are you with me? Downcast. Don't be downcast and look like Cain. Because the Lord's saying, there is a sin offering lying at your door and you're unwilling to take it and offer it. You're unwilling to obey and submit yourself. You upset. You upset. <laughs> you upset because God honored your brother and didn't honor you. Huh? Just, just so, just humble yourself, pick up your offering, amen. And your offering is Christ Jesus, praise God, hallelujah. <laughs> hallelujah. I want you to do, this is what we want you to learn how to do in 2014. We want you to learn how to take the blood of Jesus Christ and come into the holies of holies. We want you to break out of your confined circumstance and transcend by the Spirit into another realm. I'm going to say that again. I want you to break out of the confinement of your circumstances and be able to transcend into another realm. Paul said like this in the transcending, he said we have access by the Spirit into the throne of grace. We're talking about something real. To be able to go into the holies of holies, you, look, you don't have to go into holies of holies too often and you'll be changed. And in fact, if it is, Father wants us to come in there all the time. I want you to imagine the possibility that you could actually walk in the holies of holies and behold the face of God today. Now, if you don't have any faith for it, it ain't going to happen. Faith starts off with belief. I believe this. How, on, base, on what basis do I believe it? Because the Bible said so. Are you with me? The Bible said, we come boldly with the blood of Jesus Christ into the holies of holies. Right? Now, wow, I think about that. You mean with, I can come with all boldness by the blood of Jesus Christ into the holies of holies? And Paul's already spent a lot of time helping everybody understand he's not talking about the tabernacle made with hands, that which was just a shadow, that which was just a figure and a type concerning what was in the heavens, but he's talking about the real, actual holies of holies in heavenly. Okay, he's made, gone through a lot of effort to establish that. To now say in Hebrews 10, 19, now with all boldness, come with the blood of Jesus Christ and the holies of holies, with a full heart of assurance. 
full hour of faith and assurance, confidence in God that you're, this is what's happening. Okay? Walking through the very veil of Jesus' person, body, just as though you were walking through the veil of the temple. Okay? So he's made some real powerful statements. Now, the word said that, and you go, wow, is that true? Think, think, think. Okay, yes, it's true. Okay, well, then I believe that. Okay, then I believe that, then I, something's going to start happening in the believing of it. Because belief, or to believe, literally speaks of the action of your life. It's to believe it. To, to the activity of living it is to believe. The activity of living it. Okay? Uh -huh. It's to exist in it. It's a synonym. To believe it is to exist in it. Okay? It's another proper way to, to translate that. To exist, to believe it, or to exist in it. Then... Whew, you doing that, Holy Ghost comes, breathes on it, and he breathes on it something called faith, which is an elevation above belief. Yeah. See, the devils believe, don't profit them anything. Of course they know it's true, right? They believe, but they don't believe in the way in which they live in it. Yeah. Are you with me? They believe because they know it to be true. They've seen it. They understand it. <laughs> now, one of the things that puzzles me is how people can't recognize the deceptive work of Satan. And then with great earnestness and fear, cleave to God. Angels, like cherubim angels, mighty angels, mighty princes of God, who beheld the face and the glory of God and was God's ministers for who knows how long, how many, how many trillions of years. Who knows? One day was deceived by Satan's craft and turned against God, one third of them. And if Satan can do that to an angel... A cherub who stood and beheld the face of God and was his minister. What can he do to you and me? See, in knowing that, I fear and tremble. See, I don't just, that is not a concept of my mind. That is a revelation to me. See, that was a revelation to me. That's how I know that. How did that revelation begin? Reading the Word of God. Right? I said, wow, and I believe that. Hmm, interesting. I wonder how that could happen. Then, boom, revelation comes, causes me to understand what the Word of God is actually saying, doesn't take away from it, doesn't add to it, just as what the Word of God is saying. Then in then sober, sobriety, I respond out of that because every revelation is about my walk and your walk with Jesus. Huh? For, us to be un, for us to be aware and be mindful concerning the things that we're going through. Look at, look at, look, look at here. Look at what happened to Israel. One day, their rebellion went too far. God just God was, God was gentle with them. He was merciful with them. One day, their rebellion went too far and the earth opened up and swallowed them and they fell living straight down into hell. Could you imagine? You're standing here and you, you've sown so much into rebellion. You've sown so much into opposition, just not listening. Well, you know what? <coughs> we think that we're just, our standing is just as good as your standing. That mentality, you know, no reverence and respect for the divine power of God, divine order of God. And the earth opens up and, and they fall straight down into hell. Understand, people, God's instruction for us continually is dealing with us to bring us into a place of safety, <laughs> not vulnerability. You're not becoming vulnerable. You're becoming, you're becoming secure, safe, protected. The Word of God is a defense. It's a protection. The name of the Lord is like a high tower. The righteous run in and are saved. And so here we stand here talking about the name of Jesus. Come to Christ. Come here. Come live. Demon spirits that impact your life because you open the door to various forms of sin, they'll work you here. They'll work you. They'll work you. They'll work you if you brought them in. Because what's going to go on is I am set on casting out devils. I will cast them out with the word. They will go with the body, without the body. They will torment you in your mind while I'm speaking. Hallelujah. Or you will be delivered and set free. Praise God. Amen. That's what we want. Huh? But either way, the power of God is being made manifest. Amen. Hallelujah. Ha, ha, ha. I think one of the greatest German sermons Jesus ever preached was the sermon that he preached right there in Nazareth. The power of God and the anointing upon him. And what is the result of that sermon? They were going to take him and kill him. Uh, huh. But that was the first time we see Jesus do something as beautiful. He did, I think he did a total of five times. He made himself invisible. <laughs> and he passed through their hands. 
I believe that happened to me one time. I was in Mbaba, Egypt, and I'm walking down the street. I was never, everybody said, don't go to, if you go any place in Egypt, don't go to Mbaba, because that's where all the radical Islamists who was involved in 9-11 and other things in the, before that. That's where they're from. That's where they live. That's their stronghold. That's their all about, this is our area. You've got to be strict practicing Muslim to come here. And the Lord told me to go there because he had an assignment for me for a school of, 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 of women who came out of prostitution. The Lord told me to go speak the word of life to them, get them all baptized in the Holy Ghost. So I'm walking down the street fully dressed like this. Okay, in, in, in a place where they still dress like they did 2,000 years ago. You know, we go, say, go to Mississippi, say, they're 50 years behind, right? Go to, go to Mbaba, Egypt, they're 2,000 years behind. They still dress like they did 2,000 years ago. And no one saw me. No one turned their head and looked at me. So I'm, I'm certain I got to... But, you know, you never get to enjoy these things until you get yourself into the press. You got to get yourself into a risky mess. You got to put your, lay your life down. People don't want to go up and knock on someone's door and say, hey, is there anybody sick in here? By the way, I want to invite you to come to a Holy Ghost meeting. If you did, you know what would happen to you? You personally would start participating in a Holy Ghost meeting and the activity of the flow of God would be in your life and you wouldn't sit there so dead and dry, okay? You, and, and overwhelmed by your life. You have going on in your life what you see sow into. If you sow in the Spirit, you sow into the realms of the Holy Ghost, you're going to have the flow of the Holy Ghost as described in the New Testament, not described by anyone else, not described by any other commentary. Did you know that you have a running commentary? You've written it in your brain. It, you're always conforming to your running commentary. Did you know that? Look, I'm going to tell you right now, men's minds are weird. Our minds are weird. It'll play tricks on us continually. It'll cause us to believe we're right when we're wrong. And then an expert's got to come look over our shoulder and say, you know what, you're doing that wrong. But don't tell me I'm doing it wrong. I've been doing it for 20 years. Well, everything you did was wrong for 20 years then. It's been, it's been, it's been, it's been messed up. <laughs> well, I was wondering why none of it sold. I was wondering why I wasn't being successful. <laughs> oh, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. The most powerful name that exists. I declare freedom to you in Jesus' name. In the name of Jesus. Now, look, this doesn't work on unwilling heart. Be here careful. Every day, you listen to me. Every day, sin will make your heart harder. Just listen to me. Every time you give in to demonic powers, they gain a stronger hold upon you. Yesterday I was talking to a person who gave his life to the Lord in a, one of the meetings I was doing in 1982. He went on to become, you know, very successful in music. He backslid, however, for five years later. On to become very, very successful in the things he did in music. And then, not too long ago, he came back to the Lord. And he was asking me some questions yesterday. I said, look, man. I said, you got things all convoluted in your mind. Because what's happening is you're trying to superimpose things just on a person like in a foreign country or even here in the United States who never heard the gospel and then heard the gospel and came to know Jesus. You a backslider, man. And we got some strongholds we're going to have to deal with in the, because you a backslider. You backslider, come home. And he knows me, so it doesn't matter. He understands, I'm going to just talk straight. I'm not going to dilute it. I'm going to go right at, go right to the jugular. Huh? You backslider, come home. God loves you. He's happy that you come home. But there are strongholds in your life that wouldn't be in other people's lives. And we're going to break those things off of you. Listen, dear people, Satan would thro throw you into a place of deception the more you sow into sin. The more you spend time away from God, the more... He would try to fortify you against knowing God. And I'm not just talking about the knowledge of God in the, in the concept that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, that He came 2,000 years ago. He died at Calvary's cross. He was buried, rose from the dead the third day, and ascended up on high. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the knowledge of God uh, from relationship and having the fruits of relationship and an overwhelming, you know, 
manifestation of his presence out of that interaction. Hallelujah. Praise God. That's what God, that's what Father has for you. You, you know what? I'm going to communicate that to you today. You know, I look around and when I look around, I look and I see what's going on. Did you know that your face actually communicates a lot of stuff, their demeanor? You don't even have to have the word of knowledge. Just look at the face. Huh? I can just look at the face. Huh? And you just have to understand that your face is communicating an acceptance or a rejection. It is. We pray in the name of Jesus that you, you communicate acceptance. I'm standing here in Christ's stead. <laughs> I am. I'm standing here in place of Jesus. Talking to you. Thank you, Lord Jesus. And do, can you believe he sees through my eyes? He sees through my eyes. Because I've given myself to that. He feels through my feelings, my heart. I've given myself to that. And the Lord wants you to give yourself to that too. Touches through my hands. That's what he said. 2 Corinthians chapter 6. This is what he said, the covenant I will make with you in those days. I'll be your God, you'll be my people. I will dwell in you. I will walk in you. Wow. When they came out of Israel, what a great thing. He walked with them. Now he walks in us. So if we start, if we start worshiping here and we start singing, if your heart's not in it, I'm going to feel it. You know why? Because I'm feeling what he's feeling. And he's going, wait a minute, man. He's, he's going, he says, wait a minute, I'm feeling it. He's going, wait, there's stuff going on. It's not spirit and truth here. They're thinking about other things. These folks are, and, and, and somebody said, well, should it be all of us? Yeah. The only people here right now are people who are born in the spirit and say, you come into this church. I don't see it. The lost didn't make it today because you didn't go pick them up. But we're going to help you with that. Starts the sixth week of January. We are putting together a strategic, evangelistic um, roadmap and assignment for every single person. And no one's going to get, a, no get excused. No one's getting an excuse slip. Well, I'm going to write you a personal excuse slip. Unless you bring me one from the Holy Ghost, signed by Jesus. <laughs> this personally excuses me from obeying the New Testament here. I've been qualified now to do something else. No existe. <laughs> Father said, my hands, my hand my, shall seek out my enemies. My right hand shall find them who hate me. Father said, he will search out those rebellious in heart and will deliver us from them. Are you with me? Yeah. So what happens when you start getting assignments? You're like, I can't believe he expects me to do this. My goodness gracious, doesn't he appreciate the fact that I made it here? <laughs> yes. <laughs> For the first five years. <laughs> After that, you're boring. You know what I'm saying? You need to already been doing something. I mean, gee, look, the disciples in three years were everywhere. So if I'm following Jesus, I'm supposed to have a three-year plan for you. Are you with me? Yeah. Today we want you to we want you to come like corn, we want you to come like living stones and allow the Holy Ghost to position you around Christ Jesus, the cornerstone. You don't have to find your place, he'll place you. Isn't that good? Yeah. You don't have to find yourself. He found you. Are you with me? Yeah. Okay. Okay, all you gotta do is just in a sincere heart say, Oh God, here I am. Here I am to worship. Here I am to bow down. Here I am to say that you're my God. You're all together lovely, all together worthy, all together wonderful to me. So here I am to worship. 
Here I am to bow down. Here I am to say that you're my God. You're all together lovely, all together worthy, all together wonderful to me. Here I am to worship. Here I am to bow down. Here I am to say that you're my God. You're all together lovely, all together worthy, all together wonderful to me. So here I am to worship, here I am to bow down. Here I am to say that you're my God. You're all together lovely, all together worthy, all together wonderful to me. Oh, here I am to worship, here I am to bow. Here I am to say that you're my God. You're all together love, all together worth. Yes, Lord, all together. Woo! Must have been got these shot day all about people came may not. So here I am to worship. Here I am to bow down. Here I am to say that you're my God. You're all together worthy, all together worthy, all together wonderful to me. Yes, here I am to work. Here I am to bow. Here I am to say that you're my God. All together love, all together word, all together wonderful to me. Be magnified in me, Lord. Be magnified, be magnified in me, be magnified, be magnified in me, Lord, oh God, be magnified in me, be magnified, be magnified in me, Lord. Oh God, be magnified in me. Be glorified, be glorified in me, Lord. Be glorified in me. Be glorified, Lord. Be glorified in me, Lord. Be glorified in me. I am yours and you are mine. I am yours and you are mine. Be glorified. Be glorified in me. I am yours and you are mine. I am yours and you are mine. Be glorified in me. Be glorified in me. I'm the branch and you're the vine. Oh, I'm the branch and you're the vine. Be magnified in me. <laughs> Be magnified in me. 
Oh God, I'm the branch, you're the vine. Oh, I'm the branch and you're the vine. Oh God, be magnified, be magnified in me. I am yours. I am yours and you are mine. Oh God, be glorified in me. Oh God, be glorified in me. I am yours and you are mine. I am yours and you are mine. Oh God, be glorified in me. <laughs> oh God, be glorified in me. I'm the branch and you are the vine. I'm the branch and you're the vine. Oh God, be glorified. Oh God, be glorified in me. I'm the branch. I'm the branch and you're the vine. Oh God, be magnified. Oh God, be magnified in me. Be magnified in me. Be magnified in me. So di la 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 Oh God, be magnified in me, Lord Jesus. Be magnified in me. Lord, be glorified. Lord, be glorified in me. Almighty God, hallelujah. Oh, be glorified in me. I'm yours. I am yours and you are mine. Oh God. Oh God, be magnified. Oh God, be magnified in me. I am yours. I am yours and you are mine. Oh God, be glorified. Oh God, be glorified. I'm the branch and you're the vine. I'm the branch and you're the vine. Oh God. Oh God, be magnified. I'm the branch and you're the vine. Hallelujah. Oh God, be magnified in me. I'm the branch. I'm the branch in you, the vine. Oh Lord, be magnified. Oh Lord, be magnified. Lord, be magnified in me. Be magnified continually. Be magnified continually. In this church, Lord, in this church be magnified be magnified continually be magnified continually in this church lord in this church be magnified be magnified continually be magnified continually be magnified lord be magnified, be magnified, be magnified continually, be magnified continually. Oh, hallelujah, lift your voice and praise unto the Lord. Lift up your voice unto the King of Kings. Lift up your voice. Lift up your voice. Lift up your voice and sing. Hallelujah. Lift up your voice and shout, shout. Hallelujah. Be magnified in me. Lord, be 
magnified. I am yours and you are mine. I am yours and you are mine. I'm the branch and you're the vine. I'm the branch and you're the vine. I'm yours and you're mine. I am yours and you are mine. I'm the branch and you're the vine. I'm the branch and you're the vine. Be magnified. Lord, be magnified. Lord, be glorified. Lord, be glorified in me. One more time. I am yours and you're mine. I am yours and you are mine. Hallelujah. Woo-hoo. I'm the branch in your mind. I am yours. I am yours and you are mine. Woo. Hallelujah. <laughs> I'm the branch in your life. Lord, be magnified in me. Lord, be magnified in me. Lord, be glorified in me. Hallelujah. Lord, be glorified in me. I am yours and you are mine. I am branch and you're the vine, Lord. Be glorified. Oh, be glorified in me. Oh, be glorified. Hallelujah. Isn't it awesome? Woohoo! Isn't that awesome? I'm the branch, you're the vine. Say this, I am yours and you are mine. I am yours and you are mine. I'm the branch and you're the vine. <laughs> Hallelujah, be glorified in me. Oh, Lord, be glorified in me. Woo-hoo! Lord, be magnified in me. Be magnified continually. Be magnified continually. Ha, ha, ha. Lord, be magnified in me. Lord, be magnified. Let me show you. Let me show you how faith works. You know how faith works? Do you? You want to know how faith works? You want to know how it works? No, you want to know how to call in the finances you need? You want to know how to flow and operate in the gifts of the Spirit? You want to know how it works? Here's how it works. It works because you really believe this. Because it fills you and saturates your consciousness, your identity, who you think you are, what you know about yourself. Everything, it's so real to you. That's why it's like, it's like you got it. It's yours. It's more than, more than, more than can be quantified. Billions and trillions of dollars or whatever it is that makes people so excited about whatever. Here's how faith works. You ready? Here's how it works. Knowing this. I am yours and you are mine. This, this, is how, this is how easy it is. Then you can go do anything. It's true. Huh? I'm the branch and you're the vine. I, I am yours and you are mine. <laughs> Woo! I'm the branch and you're the vine. <laughs> Be 
glorified in me. Be glorified in me. See, here's what the Lord did. He locked up and contained everything concerning all of his gifts, all of his working, the manifestation of his power, all within the interaction of relationship with him that begins by knowing and believing that God loves us. That be, then moves forward in just doing like a little child what he said, go do. Go conquer the world. <laughs> I pray that you see the fruit of that in my life. And I'm desperate to see the fruit of it in your life as well. Amen. We'll see the fruit of it in our lives together. Amen. 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 <laughs> 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 yeah. can be seated. You know, if you were really interested in football or if you're interested in surfing or you're interested in any sport activity and you saw your champion doing something amazing, amazing feat, you come to your feet and you're, woo! Do it! Are you with me? See, that's what's going on with me. I see Jesus. When I go to worship it in spirit and truth, and I start talking about what he's done for me. I'm, I am yours and you are mine. He made me. I'm his purchased possession. He bought me Calvary. Woo! I'm watching the champion of my faith do some amazing feats on my behalf. Praise God. Hallelujah. In the name of Jesus Christ. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus Christ, I demand change of your life right now. According to the commandments of the living God, according to the instructions of the Holy Ghost. And the purposes of the ministry of Jesus here upon this earth. This day will be a milestone in your life, a turning point. That you'll look back on and say, that was the day I yielded up my spirit to the Lord. That was the day I said, I no longer live. Christ, he lives in me. That was the day I resigned fully to flowing and operating in the things that he's purchased for my life and purpose for me to do. That's the day my heart became earnest about being baptized in the Holy Ghost. Baptized in the realms of his divine power and his glory where I was no longer seen nor lived my own life. Anyway. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus, for your precious blood. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus, for this cleansing of my soul. Thank you, Jesus, for the cross upon which you died. Where resurrection life was born. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Thank you, mighty God. Oh, Bishop of my faith. Thank you, mighty God. For this grace. Oh, thank you, Captain of my salvation, that you run the glorious holy race. Amen. Amen. Praise God for his goodness. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Blessed is the name of the Lord. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Come on in. Good to see you. It's good to see you. Bless you. It's good to have Japan here for the holidays. Amen. Come on in. Come on in. Good to see you. Bless you, my brother. Bless you. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord Jesus.
Well, let me get right into this, okay? Just perfect timing. Just getting ready to start ministering here. Praise God. Open your Bibles to um, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Woo. Praise the name of Jesus. Praise the mighty name of the living God. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for this wonderful work of grace. Hallelujah. Kambando brestekita lamane. Somebody said, what verse? Just hang on. We're going to start right at the beginning. Said Corinthians chapter 5 for those, if I didn't say it outright. Thank you, mighty God. You know, I just believe with all of my heart that the Lord's going to get you ready here for all the work of 2014. We've got a lot of work to do in 2014. I mean, with the launching of School of Evangelism, with the launching of the School of, of Missions, things are going to another level in every dimension. And, um, and I pray that you're today, I pray that you're going to sign up to go ahead and be, begin to live your life in heaven in a whole nother, in a whole nother level of commitment. And so, and if you're not, you're going to be worn out because it's going to take you divine grace for you to begin to do these things that the Lord's charted out for us to do it in 2014. So, <laughs> as I begin to read the, this passage of Scripture and minister to you out of this Scripture, I hope that you begin to understand that there is a heavenly vision for you to have. Now, look, the heavenly vision is truly encapsulated within the framework of, of the heavenly vision that Paul communicated as he stood and gave it a defense for who he was before King Agrippa. And he said, I've been, he said, I've been faithful to the heavenly vision. And he told what the heavenly vision was. He said... That after having met Jesus on the road to Damascus, he was given an assignment to go turn people from the power of Satan to God. I mean, that's a, that's a wonderful way to do an altar call. Say, I turn you from the power of Satan right now unto God. I open up your blinded eyes right now from death to life. What a privilege. To have to walk around in that kind of authority is the authority that we are mandated by Christ Jesus to have. That authority is it going to be really recognized and lived out in our life until the intimacy of the relationship comes down to, I am yours and you are mine, Lord. I'm the branch and you're the vine. Be magnified in me. Be magnified in me. Be magnified in me. Be magnified in me. So it's, the Lord's locked it all up within this framework of relationship. To just know and believe the love that God has for us. To walk around in this wonderful realm of divine power and glory. Recognizing that he's done all of these things for us that are unimaginable. He's given to us the ability, the same ability that he expressed and showed. When he walked this earth 2,000 years ago to go boldly and confidently do the same thing that he did himself, he did. To go and look at the captives and set them free, to have the authority to do whatever it is that we need to do in order to see the kingdom of God move forward in the lives of people. This morning, this morning I received an email um, concerning the Mission Training Center in Nepal. And the person who's called the Apostle of Nepal, uh, Brother Prim, Prim Parham, who's no longer alive, but he's, he's, there's a book about him. It's called The Apostle of Nepal. He actually built this mission training center himself, and it fell out of the hands of the church because of just the way the government's set up there. They don't recognize the church, never have. So you can't have something in the name of the church. And it's fallen into the hands of people who don't care anything about the ministry. And so I, I was told, given an email this morning, they said uh, that they didn't want to sell it. I said, well, we're going to pray about that. <laughs> and so the first part of it, just the first part of moving in authority is knowing that you've been given the authority by the Lord Jesus Christ to go do the things that are necessary to be done so that people can be saved. 
And many cases, as you begin to evangelize right around this area. For those, you know, there's some of our friends from Japan, they don't know this. We just moved into this building. We're in process of moving. We're just moving in. Moving into this property. And so we're getting ready to launch an evangelistic campaign. Amen. The army of God's being mobilized to, to hit every house here. We want every one of you to be involved in it. But if you recognize that you've got to go with more than just an invitation card, you've got to go with the authority that has been prescribed to us and given to us in Christ Jesus. And you can boldly go because you know who you are. You know you the branch. You know he's the vine and that he's purposed to bring forth the fruit of his glory in your life. And that, listen, the fruit of his glory is demonstrated by what Jesus did. He turned water into wine, showed forth his glory. <laughs> Hallelujah. He, he, he raised the dead at name to, to life again, showed forth his glory. Listen, this works in Japan too. You just go around and start knocking on people's house and ask somebody in there, say, is there anybody sick need prayer? <laughs> we're here to bless you. Instead of, instead of going with some other message, just knock on the door and say, look, you know, we're here to pray for you. Is there anybody here that needs prayer? Is anybody sick in the house? You've got financial problems. Or do you have fear or torment? We have authority over that. We're going to break it. You're going to have an encounter with Christ Jesus, and you're going to know that he's living and that he's Amen. here. And he's not dead and, you know, gone like some other religious leader. He's present, and he's going to do today what he did then. Uh, hallelujah. Come on, David. Right I'm, I'm very earnest about this in Japan, but I'm just, just, just as earnest about it here. You know, I, have, I am committed to seeing huge numbers of fish processed this year. I'm right here talking to the workers here today. This is a workers' meeting here on Sunday morning. But, you know, beginning of the first of the year, you know, we're not going to be having workers' meetings on Sunday morning anymore. It's going to be just about processing masses of numbers of fish. How many fish can you catch in a week? How many fish can you bring into the place? How many, I mean, you think about all of the children, all of the young people, uh, kids even from the ages of 5 years old to 12 years old that can be out there in that parking lot. You think of all the fish that can be caught uh, through the week and then brought here on Sunday morning. I have, uh, I have... Uh, Chrissy put together some really good statistics, shows the amount of effort that's going to have to, people are going to have to be willing to step into and, 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 and participate with to, to go fishing. But the Lord's made us fishers of men, so what else are we going to be doing with the life? I mean, come on. If we're following Jesus and not being fishers of men, give me a break. Are you listening to me? What are we doing when we say we're following Jesus, but we're not being fishers of men? What are we following him doing then? Walking around? I mean, we just, we, just, we just walk around with him, and then if he starts doing something, then we sit down and don't do anything. No, 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 no. We can, if we're going to follow Jesus, that means we imitate him. And then, then we get our inner identity right. We're fishers of men. Well, how do we fish men? With divine power and authority. That's how we fish men. We come to bless people. We come to bless people. I, I, mean, I don't walk up to people and say, listen, anybody ever told you about Jesus? I, I walk up to people and say, listen, I want to bless you. I'm here to bless you. I'm here to, I, I, I want to give you a blessing. Would you like to have a blessing? Well, what do you mean? Yeah, I'm here to bless you. I've given authority to bless you. Well, where'd you get that authority from? Christ Jesus, the King of kings and Lord of lords, and he wants to prove it right now. I know you've heard all kinds of things about him. You know what? I don't know. I, 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 I dare say that uh, very few people in the United States of America have heard something, haven't at least heard something about Jesus. But most of what they've heard is wrong. And so there's going to have to, you can't start off with that. You're going to have to start off with divine power and authority. You can't come like a scribe or a Pharisee. You have to come like somebody who's been given a commission. <laughs> Hallelujah. Praise God. So today I'm just here, I'm here to give you a commission. I'm here to build you up in the faith in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. I'm here to see you get emboldened by the power of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen. Thank you, mighty God. <laughs> So I want to give you another perspective. I want to give you, uh, well, hopefully not another perspective, but the perspective of who you are and what the heavenly vision looks like. So I want you to open your Bible, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 1. And I want you to listen with the reality of the ears as though that the, these things are going to happen to you not later, but now. Amen. I'm, living my life, I'm living my life right, right now. That I'm going to give an account to the Lord Jesus Christ like right now. I'm not going to wait and go buy oil when the, you know, when the trumpet sounds, as it were. 
I'm not going to wait till suddenly, you know, well, my goodness, I just got to, you know, that somebody just gave me the evidence that I'm going to be uh, gone and dead in the next five or six hours, so I better get everything prepared. No, no, no. I'm not going to wait and act like somehow that it's going to happen, you know, when I turn, you know, in my 70s or 80s when most people, whatever, die. 90, 70, 80 is usually where it is. Okay? I'm going to start preparing right now. I want you to prepare right now. I want you to prepare for the certainty right now. Because listen, I want to say this to you. If you do not prepare to give an account for your life right now, as though this was your last minute of life, then in reality what it is, you're postponing ever being prepared to give an account. You're postponing it by the very act of waiting till later to truly deal with the certainty, the force of you and I standing before the presence of the Lord. Now listen to what Paul says, he, how he opens this up. He says, for we know that if our earthly tent, like house, I'm verse 1, okay, for we know, now this is my translation of the Bible. You say, what translation is he using? I'm using my translation. My translation is translated in peer review. There's peer review for it. It will do no violence to the text. I just translated for the purpose of just bringing things out just a little bit more clearly. Okay? Are you with me? Yeah. So whatever your translation says, fine. It will work. Okay? But I think you're going to hear some, some things that, that are very important to me in my passion and pursuit of the things of heaven as you listen to this. For we know that if our earthly tent-like house were destroyed... We have a building from God, a house not made by hands, eternal in the heavens. Now, I want you to understand that when, you're, when you die and you breathe out your last breath, your spirit goes out of you and your body is going to go to a grave and you're going to decompose and that body will not exist ever again. That body will be destroyed. Are you listening to me? Now, I'm going to get in here to some stuff where Paul's going to talk about he don't want his body destroyed. He wants to be changed. He, just wants, he wants to change, the immediate change. huh? And we're going to get to that in just a minute. But this is what we're living for. Can you imagine living every day in the concept of I am living for a heavenly realm. Yeah. And beautiful thing of it is I'm living in a heavenly realm right now to be able to live in a heavenly realm. To, to put on a heavenly tabernacle. He said, indeed, for in this dwelling... We groan earnestly, desiring to be clothed with one from heaven. Can you, see, can you hear that? I'm living. I have this great intense desire to, be, to put on that resurrected body that Christ Jesus himself put on that, that the New Testament is witnesses, witness to, that Paul was an eyewitness to. Because he saw Jesus on the road to Damascus in his resurrected body. And he wasn't naked. He wasn't, he wasn't a without a body. He was at a very tangible body. And so Paul's laying this thing out so we get a vision of ourselves. He says, and if we are clothed, we certainly should not be found naked. Because he's talking about being clothed with a heavenly body. Not naked, not just a spirit just floating around. Huh? Just spirits floating around? No, not a spirit floating around because then you'd be naked. Right? No. Clothed, clothed with a, with a heavenly tabernacle, a heavenly building that is, that's not made by hands. It's eternal in the heavens. For indeed, while we are in this tabernacle, we groan being burdened. Not that we would be unclothed, but clothed that mortality might be swallowed up by life. Paul's not interested in being unclothed for a single second. In fact, I believe verse 4 is talking about the translation, about talking about the catching away. Because he refers to it, he just referred to it in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, what he said was, he said, I show you mystery, we will not all sleep, but be changed in a moment in twinkling of an eye. <laughs> and this, this mortal will put on the immortal, the earthly, the heavenly. It would be changed in a moment, trinkling with night, at the last trump. He said to the Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, he says that we which are alive and remain should not prevent those that are dead, for the dead in Christ shall rise first. 
But we which are alive shall be instantly changed. And once again, instantly changed at a moment, twinkling, given eye. Well, what are we doing? We're groaning. We're, we're earnestly longing for, desiring to be clothed with the heavenly realm. To we're earnestly desiring to be clothed, transformed, changed by the power of God with, with, in respect, in respect to the fact that Christ Jesus is coming. The king of heaven right now reigns as king of heaven. And you and I need to be running around getting as many people ready as possible. You and I need to be running around inviting people to the feast, inviting people to the supper, inviting people to the celebration. The celebration's about ready to go down. The celebration isn't, it, it, it can be understood in terms of the church meeting. The celebration is bigger than the church meeting. The celebration is that moment and that day where Christ Jesus comes and everything begins to be set in divine order according to what God purposed in the very beginning. And sin and unrighteousness and all that which is, belongs to the rebellious realm is completely removed out of our influences. I want you to think about this. People say, why is it so easy for folks to step over and be captivated by the demonic. Why is it so easy for people to step over into the realm of the demonic and live in the demonic and seem so difficult for people to step over and live completely captivated by the realms of the heavenly, the Holy Ghost? Why? Well, I want you to imagine for a moment that if all of the programming, if all of the music, if all the advertisement, if all the entertainment all the conversation and all the purposes of businesses and everything else around us was all about the kingdom of God. If it was all saturated with the kingdom of God, how easy it would be for you and I to step over into a realm called divine glory. How easy it would be for you and I to be constantly being in that place saturated with the influence of the Holy Ghost, completely given over to the things of God. But it's, it's upside down. Rather, the world is saturated by demonic influence. Everywhere you go, programming, music, entertainment, purpose, jobs, reason for living, the conversation of men. What does it look like? It's from a demonic realm. It's imposed upon us. And it's like God's people sitting around waiting to get permission. God's, God's people sitting around waiting to get permission to influence the way that dress goes down and fashion. God's people sitting around waiting for permission to influence television programming and the media. Listen to me. What's happening is I see here. Here's what's happening. Listen to me. I watch God's people not just sitting around waiting to get permission, but they are under the influence of that demonic realm and therefore are neutralized. Dressing like the, like the world dresses. Somebody said, well, what does that mean? Are, is, are you talking to me about... Are you talking about ultra holiness here? What are you talking about? No, no, no. I've just gone over into the realms of the spirit and I've looked at how angels of darkness dress and behave themselves. They, they set the fashion. They set the trend. They are the ones who impose upon men's minds the imagination to do the things that they do. They are, what, they are the ones who impose upon man's imagination to do the, the hate and the war crimes and the evil and all of the ungodliness that you see in a world around you. And then you say, well, that's the fashion. I want to emulate that, having no idea that that is literally the realm of a satanic thing that took place being translated from an angel of darkness into the imagination of a human being, people, community of people, susceptible to that instruction. Now, dear people, you and I are supposed to be clean, completely, and totally escaped from all of that. You and I are supposed to be living in the realm where that influence can't touch us, can't impact us. Well, where, where, what, what does that realm look like? A realm looks like work, walking in the Spirit. A realm looks like walking in the Spirit, then I'm living for heaven. Now I'm interacting with Christ Jesus. And I'm interacting with the Holy Ghost. And I'm interacting with angels from above. Well, well why, why would I need to do that? I won't need to do that because I'm obeying God. I'm walking out 
a walk with God. It's not about sitting around in church being entertained. It's rather about walking out a commission that we received from heaven that Christ Jesus described to us by his life that has been written down for us in the word of God that the Holy Ghost is showing us and that all the world around us and every influence around us is opposed to. Now, if there's a change going to be made in this world for the kingdom of God, it ain't going to be made by Alexander the Great. It isn't going to be made by Napoleon. It isn't going to be made by presidents and prime ministers and, as it were, great men of the earth. Those aren't changes that are going to make a difference in the state of humanity. It's someone who's simply going to believe what God says, and it can be anyone. A simple little servant girl can change a simple little servant girl who is a slave, sold into slavery, can change a nation in a day. Change a nation in a day. Somebody say, give me a break. Isn't that a little bit exaggerated? Isn't that a little bit overboard? No, a young woman who was a slave was sold from slavery from Cappadocia into the nation of Georgia. One miracle. Because somebody brought a little baby by her house, because in those days if a baby was sick, they would take, their custom was to take the baby by every house and see if anybody recognized the disease and had a cure. That was the way they practiced medicine in those days. She comes to this house, this slave girl was slave, sold into slavery by a Roman magistrate, answers the door, says, yes, I have the cure, lays her hand on the baby and prays for the baby in the name of Jesus happened in the second century A.D. Second century, 200 years approximately after Jesus died and rose again, set upon the throne of glory to reveal his power and his grace to all men through his church. Slave girl. She didn't have the right to go to church. There was no church. She was it. She was it. She was it. One girl. One slave girl up against a whole nation. What could she do? Oh, if she could recognize who she is. She could get a heavenly vision. If she could understand that she doesn't have to be influenced by the mandates of angels of darkness and demon spirits but rather liberated to live under the reign of one Christ Jesus. My. She'll change a nation. She lays her hands on the baby, prays for the baby in Jesus' name. Baby is healed. It did not take long. One day, one hour, one day. She was ready, prepared for one hour. Did not take long. And the queen of Georgia heard that this woman, this slave girl, had prayed for a little baby and the baby was cured of its disease. The queen being afflicted by a disease for many years. Called for the slave girl. The slave girl came in. Laid her hands on the queen. Hallelujah. Ha ha. Hallelujah. There was a great church in Cappadocia. It was started by the apostle Peter. <laughs> we know what the apostle Peter did. I know how apostle Peter ministered Jesus. I know what, it, what he did. I know that if I'm going to be right with God and ready to give an account, I'm going to do what he did. I'm going to reach into that realm. I know how he ministered. Because as soon as people heard he was coming to town, they, they went and got their sick and brought them out and laid them in the street. All they needed was his shadow. He was groaning. He was given over, longing for a heavenly realm to be clothed with that heavenly, heavenly realm while he lived in that heavenly realm. Dear people, you're going to have to sober, sober up and shake off the chains of worldliness and ungodliness that have bound you. Influences of demon spirits that have neutralized you. They come in very subtle ways. They kept faith from exploding in your life. They kept blessings from being realized by your life. It's time to wake up. 
Recognize that you don't belong to yourself. You were bought with a price. You belong to a church that was purchased by the blood of Jesus Christ. You are his purchased possession. You are his tabernacle in which he dwells. There's nothing profane or common about you. There's nothing ordinary about your life. Nothing. You're going to have to quit listening to this, the atmosphere around us. Paul described in Ephesians chapter 2, saying that the very atmosphere was filled with the, God, the propaganda of the God of this world. The spirit that now works in the children to disobedience. We have to understand that all these things that are going through our mind are not logical conclusions of our lie. They're not rational descriptions of who we are. It's a false identity. We have to understand it's an accusation and a slander that has never stopped. Ezekiel chapter 28, Ezekiel begins to show how that Satan began to slander God. And in his slander against God, he turned men's hearts away from God. Nothing stopped. Jesus said, I, Jesus talked about how Satan, uh, well, rather, Isaiah talked about how Satan tried to lift himself up above God, above the knowledge of God, and ultimately by the revelation of Jesus in Revelation chapter 12, we understand how he drew away one third of the angels. Now, listen to me now. If Satan's lies and propaganda can influence a cherubim angel who stood before the face of God doing the service of God for an untold number of years, an undefined length of time, what can his influence do to you and me as he tries to infect our mind and our thinking? Produce doubt. Produce question. Like, does God really love me? Is God really going to use me in this way? And then try to show you based upon some experience, which is not necessarily a true experience at all. Because it's convoluted with doubt and unbelief. Convoluted with false beliefs. Convoluted with compromises. Try to point out how it didn't work out for you back then. No, 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 I'm not interested in it. Somebody tried to say to me the other day, Please define for me, when does, when does a Christian really get changed? When does a believer really become a new creation? I said, your problem is this. You're trying to interpret the Word of God based on your experience. You're trying to look through the eyes of your perception. And your eyes of your perception are convoluted with all kinds of wrong things and variables that cannot be defined. You're going to have to turn to the Word of God and look at the Word of God. This is what God said in His Word. This is the way it is. I accept it. I embrace it. This is the faith that overcomes the world. Amen. This change now. Listen to me. God is giving you an opportunity this day to take a hold of a divine power and authority to live your life in a different way. Amen. Now let me say this. You're going to have to stop listening to the advice of men. <laughs> Hallelujah. You're going to have to start listening to what the Word of God says. You have to take it as a newborn baby. You have to be willing, you and I are going to have to be willing to follow Jesus. You and I are going to have to be willing to follow Paul. You know what, you know what the Lord Jesus did? He said, Paul's got it right. It's like this, it's like this. It's like Jesus said, Paul's got it right. Have him write everything down that he knows and give it to the church. That's the New Testament. That's two-thirds of the New Testament. He's, Paul's got the right relationship with me. Paul's got it right in his experience. Paul's got it right in how he knows me. Have him write down everything that has been revealed to him, that he's lived out. Now, you and I got it some 2,000 years later, and we're sitting here looking at this going, What? Can it be? And the atmosphere is charged with all this lies and propaganda against God saying, no, it cannot be. No, you get yourself back over there and go to work and shut up and don't worry about the lost and dying world. And forget about the whole thing. And whatever other nonsense. 
Satan tries to place upon us, making us unclean, unworthy, unable, filling us with doubt and unbelief. <laughs> Thirteen years ago, this is this is an $18 million property. 80,000 square foot of building space. Nine acres of land. Cost about 18 million bucks. 13 years ago, I said, Lord, give us this property here. We need this property. And you know, we've been laboring and seeing many things take place over 13 years. Prior to 13 years, that that was at that time we had the we had the big property out on the naval training center seeing so many great things happen in god seeing thousands of people in the church literally tens of thousands of people in the church came through those meetings you name the ministry just about every big ministry they came through at one time or another <laughs> i mean one 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 big meeting we had it was like Every name that was, was the name that you wanted to get to come to a meeting that was flowing in the anointing in the mid-90s was there that night. And I, I had this longing in my heart. I said, Father, I know that you are positioning things for a great outpouring of your power and glory upon Southern California. And I want to be right there on time with you, ready to move in the direction that you lead. Now, I thought that we would see hundreds of thousands of souls come into the, min come into the kingdom long ago. I had no idea God would do things the way he's done them. And man, my goodness, what an adventure it's been. What amazing things have happened just over the past 20 years. But what I do know is I recognize and it don't, you have to say, oh, God, give me a sign. You don't need a sign. You don't need a sign. You've got one gigantic sign right now. You're sitting in one. That this is a moment in time where you're about ready to do something like you never did before in Southern California. Now, understand, Southern California, that's, that's a pretty big thing to say. Because Southern California, this is the place that what was called the Jesus Revival began. Huh? Are you listening to me? There was a, oh, was a huge bringing in of millions of people into the kingdom of God. This is right here in Southern California. Seven great denominations were born here. Well, I'm going to say at least five great denominations, okay? Assemblies of God, four square. Well, there's a lot of denominations were born right here in Southern California. And yet God is preparing to do something that is bigger than anybody's ever seen. And that's really what it's, that's the way it's like with God anyways. Everything he does is always bigger. Huh? Why? Because he's just bringing people to a place of cooperating with them to the bigger, for the bigger. Hallelujah. He's given to us a place and position where we can come into all the fullness of everything that he has. And that's bigger. It's where we're willing to receive it. Here Father has positioned us. Here we are right now at the precipices of time with a divine opportunity and who's going to mind their day of visitation. There are people who sat in this place that did not know the day of their visitation in 1995. They didn't hear it. They didn't know it. They didn't respond. There are people that are sitting here who did know the time of their visitation and they did respond and did participate. There are people who are not here anymore. There are hundreds of people who aren't here anymore. That for one reason or the other went here, went there, did other things. But here God has brought us to a moment in time that he wants us to begin to fully live for him. And if we're willing to fully live for him, we're going to participate in what he's getting ready to do. Because by definition, what God is getting ready to do, the only people that can do it with him are those who are fully living for him. You won't, you'll disqualify yourself. If you're not fully living for him, you're disqualified. You can't hear him say, raise the dead. Too afraid. You can't hear him say, turn the water into wine. Too afraid. You can't hear him say, knock on that door. Whoever answers the door, I'm going to heal him. I don't care what it is. Deaf, blind, crippled, doesn't matter. 
Cancer? Huh? Huh? Living in the heavenly realm, I believe with all of my heart that Father has locked all of these things up, as it were, into personal relationship with the Lord Jesus. And that personal relationship with the Lord Jesus works within our lives a whole new perspective of who we are and what we're supposed to be doing. Because we're really, we're really earnest about giving an account to the boss. Got to give an account to the boss. But are we earnest about giving an account to the father? We're really earnest about our reputation and how well of a job we're doing in terms of the eyes of men. But are we really earnest about how well we're doing our job in the eyes of what Christ Jesus has commissioned us to go and do? Oh, hallelujah. <laughs> Let me see if I can... Read a few more of these verses of Scripture. Hallelujah. To see mortality swallowed up by life. Huh? Hallelujah. I don't believe that's just talking about going to dust in the grave and being raised up with a resurrected body. I believe that's being changed in a moment and in twinkling of an eye. So who says we're not, who says we're not living in that day? Who says we're not living in the day of the Lord where we ch be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye? Who says we're not? Who, can you prove that to me? Can you prove to me we're not living in that day, not living at that moment? can happen right now. Huh? I'm going to tell you right now. I'm, I'm going to live in this realm. I'm going to live with this identity. I want, to I want to encourage you to grab a hold of this same interaction with Christ Jesus that would cause you to be so aware of this that your anticipation, your deepest longing and desires are about having this event rather than about where you're going to, go to, get, where you're going to have your employment, where you're going to get your money, where you're going to get your food, where you're going to get your clothing, where you're going to get your friends, where you're going to get your fame, where you're going to go to school, what you're going to do with the rest of your life. Because that's what a lot of people are groaning and agonizing over. But be just to be so caught up in the realms of the Spirit. Paul said, I don't even know. I'm not sure. Was I in my body or out of my body? I can't tell you. Hallelujah. All I know is when I went up into the realms of heaven. And I heard things that I cannot tell anybody. Wow. But he ministered out of it. And having seen that and having been there, having interacted continually in that realm, you longing to just be there. Paul's not longing to die. He's not longing to die. So I mean, oh, he's groaning. He's out, what's out of here. I just want to go. How about what out of here? I want to go be with Jesus. He's not doing that. He's longing for that day of the Lord where everything that belongs to a realm of darkness ceases to exist and there's not any iota of separation between him and all that Papa has. Because he's captivated by it. God wants to baptize you in the Holy Ghost so you can be captivated by heaven. I think that so many people made baptism in the Holy Ghost just about the initial evidence of tongues. The baptism in the Holy Ghost is far more than just the initial evidence of tongues. Listen to me now. <laughs> Hear me. The baptism in the Holy Ghost is where you and I are now living and dwelling in a realm called the heavenlies. Hallelujah. Seated with Him in a heavenly realm. Acts, uh, Ephesians 2, 6. There in a place. Blessed with all spiritual blessings in that heavenly realm. Ephesians 1, 3. Operating and functioning in, functioning in that realm. You know how I get to live in heaven every day? Because I touch heaven. I touch heaven. People want to make it passive. Can I talk to you? Yes. Can I talk to you? Because if you'll do what I'm telling you, if you'll start touching heaven, you'll be different. You won't live the life you've lived. You won't live the life you've lived. I know one preacher used to go around singing, I surrender 10%. <laughs> There's a prophetic nature. So if he got to one church and it was a little better, ah, we surrender 30% here. 
because the song goes, I surrender all. Huh? He said, I'm not going to tell a lie because there's no all in here. I'm not going to agree with something that's not true. Tell you guys are ready to repent, then we'll get into the all. Can we move from the 10%, 30% to by the end of the meeting, everybody be able to honestly before God not lie? It's terrible to lie to people, isn't it? But it's ter worse to lie to God. Say, God, by the testimony, oh, well, it's just a song. Uh-huh, I knew that. I, I knew that. I saw the insincerity there. No, it's not just a song. It's a prayer. It is a confession set to music. It is, I'm talking to God when I sing. I'm talking to God when I sing as much as I talk to Father when I pray. It's just that people have made it into nothing but an in entertainment game of kumbaya sing-along. Forgive me for being a prophet. For just a few minutes and listen to me. Many of the songs people sing in church, churches today are, are written by people who don't walk with God. It was, it was written for the sake of money and gain and fame. And the same spirit which it was written in, was written in, becomes communicated in the very meaning. Because Satan's attached to it. He's a deceiver and a liar. He's got tricks nobody even understands. You listen to me. It's true. You need the fire of God to fall upon everything in your life. The fire of God will burn up all the chaff, the lies of false prophets. The fire of God will burn up the wood, the stubble, and the hay. It'll burn it up. And if there's going, if you're going to, if you and I are going to, I'm not, I'm not missing out on what Papa's about to do. I love people. But I'm going to move with the wind of the Spirit to drive the chaff away. Amen. I'm going to move with the authority of His Word, just like a hammer, and break the rocks in two. I'm going to. I'm going to step into the ministry, His winnowing fork ministry. Praise God. Hallelujah. I'm going to cast out devils, not accommodate them. I'm going to come up against rebellion and dissension, not make it comfortable. Hmm. True. Fathers, do that in your home. Things get straightened out real quick. Mm -hmm. But don't wait till you've been living with it for accommodating it for 20 years, then try to do something about it because it's stronghold, it's rooted. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you live under its branch. Are you listening to me here? Yeah. <laughs> you watch my school, you watch what happens. You watch what happens. 1906, April 1906, 90 miles up the road. At Azusa Street, 50 people gathered together. 50, 50 people gathered together. 50 people gathered together 100 years ago, approximately. A little less than. Oh, forgive me. A little more than. 1906, April 1906. Fifty people crying out for the fire of God to fall, for the baptism of heaven to come, so that they lived in the realms of divine glory as Jesus taught us. They lived in the heavenly realm instead of an earthly realm, where became ambassadors and those commissioned to represent him with the fire of the Holy Ghost, with power from on high. Today, those fifty people in just a little more than 100 years have been turned into 600 million. 600 million in a little over 100 years. So what happens over the next 10 years? What if God, did, when God's people begin to take a hold of him, begin to praise him in the sanctuary in the atmosphere of his power, what happens? What happens when somebody like me starts groaning? Starts longing. Huh? Why? I'm longing to be clothed fully with everything that heaven has for me. All that belongs to the resurrection and all that which Father has purchased. Because I'm so captivated by every other dimension of heaven that is for me now. Being baptized in the Holy Ghost and fire. And you're never going to move from one to, the other, uh, one to the other without the first thing happening. Baptized in His divine glory and power. Clothed with the majesty of the Holy Ghost. Clothed with Christ. 
Put on therefore Christ Jesus and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lust. Huh? Be, be endued with power from on high. Paul's taking it to another level now. He's not just talking about be clothed with Christ Jesus, put on <laughs> the Lord Jesus Christ. He's not just talking about be endued or be clothed with the Holy Ghost, being clothed with power, be baptized in the Holy Ghost. Fire. He's talking about, he's talking about, and you shall see me as I am, for you shall be like me. He's talking about 1 John chapter 3, verse 1. Beloved, now are you the sons of God. It doth not yet appear what you should be, but you know in that day you shall see him as he is, for you shall be like him. Wow. Clothed with the same resurrection glory that Christ Jesus himself showed up with because he purchased it for us. Because he purchased it for us. Because we don't even exist outside of him. I'm in him. He's in me. I'm the branch and he's the vine. Listen to me. Unlocks faith. It unlocks faith. Will you allow faith to be unlocked in your life? Will you allow the authority of Jesus Christ to be manifested in your life because you accept that you abide in him, you are a branch, he's the vine. Amen. You don't exist outside of him. Just accept that. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. <laughs> <laughs> Everything changes there. When you begin to cry out, oh God, now baptize me in the Holy Ghost and fire. Oh God, now give me that wonderful realm of grace so that I might fully live out this life that I have consecrated myself to live, so that I might now sing with all of my heart, I surrender all, I surrender all, all to Jesus, my Redeemer, I surrender all. I'm going to sing it with all my heart now. Come on, man, I'm not going to hold back. I'm not going to have some kind of evil working on the inside of me, some lie working, some spirit of a lie working on the inside of me. If it's 10%, then I'm going to sing, I surrender 10%. I don't want to get to 90. Who's going to sing that? You're not going to show in on that song. You're not going to join in on that song. If I started singing that, if you went in, you're not joining in. Your heart, your heart will convict you. Start trying to sing, I surrender 10%. Ah, but will your deeds convict you? Will your deeds convict you? Will you, will you be transparent before the Lord? Will you let your confession become your life? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. In Jesus' name. Verse 5. Now God himself has brought this about for us. <laughs> that is pretty radical. I want... Mortality to be swallowed up with life. And then for Paul to say, God himself has brought this about for us. Wait a minute. What are you doing now? Paul, you calling those things which are not as though they were? What are you doing? What are you saying? Yeah, Jesus, are, Jesus said, I go away to prepare a place for you. If you're not so, I wouldn't have told you. Isn't that what he said? John chapter 14, verse 1. said, believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many dwellings. Huh? I go away to prepare a place for you, and I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am you may be there also. Is that true? Yeah. It is true. It's true in, in several different ways. Because Paul makes it true in Acts chapter 2, forgive me, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 6. He makes it true in a spiritual way. We're seated together with him in the heavenly realm. Is that true? Yeah. That's what he said. Hallelujah. He said we're in him, and he's in us. We have access into the throne room. Amen. For us to live as Christ. Huh? Jesus said to himself... They were to abide in him. If we abide in him and his word abides in us, we'll ask whatever we want and we'll have it. I asked for this 13 years ago, 13 years. I didn't, well, look, we just didn't stop. I asked for the city. I asked God to give me 3.2 million people 30 years ago and not stopped. And watch what happens because I believe God's going to escalate the thing. And what I was describing, going from 50 to 600 million in a little over 100 years. Hallelujah. My goodness, I see the nations of the earth transformed in a day. Yes. Can a nation be saved in a day? Yes. I say yes. I say the Lord was saying that for us to answer yes, Amen. not no. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Huh. I mean, my goodness, the queen got healed of Georgia. King, 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 1800 years ago, proclaimed Georgia belonging to Jesus Christ, a nation that served Jesus. And called for ministers and people that give them the word and teach them the gospel. Changed the day. 
What's God going to do through you, for, through you to this community? There's apartment complexes there, apartment complexes there, high school right across the street, junior college right over here, right across the street. What's going to happen? I'm telling you, God is organizing a Holy Ghost blitz. He's going to drop a Holy Ghost bomb and vaporize everything that is unlike him so that people can come into the kingdom. He's going to do the same thing in Japan. He's going to do the same thing in Japan. Japan's not going to have churches of 30 people. A friend of mine, a friend of mine just got back from Japan and he said if you go to a church and it has 31 people in it, it's a mega church. <laughs> it's true. It's true. Pastor, tell you there. It's true. Change. You think fathers? You think fathers happy with that a condition? You think fathers happy with the condition of things? You think he's withholding his power? That he's withholding his wisdom? He's withholding his divine insight? He's withholding his grace from the kinds of results that he described in his word? No. We withhold ourselves. And if we're not careful, we'll be just like Israel. Wherein have we sinned? Wherein have we withheld ourselves? For we will seek to justify ourselves even if we try to make God a liar about the whole program. Because wow. huh? we don't think clear on things. Huh? We don't think clear. We don't have ability. Deception doesn't think clear. Religion has been a prison. The Lord has shown me more in the past year about the strongholds of rebellion, even in Pentecostal denominational churches, that they, they began to be formed by the power of God and, and quickly were imprisoned by the power of Satan and they've never broken free. So what is God going to do? He's going to do a new thing. Someone said, what does that look like? The old thing? <laughs> the same thing he's always been doing because he's the same. Yesterday, day, forever, does not change. Huh? He's just going to do it with greater magnitude. Praise God. Hallelujah. You want to walk in discernment? You want to walk in spiritual discernment? Don't allow any sin in your life. At all. Don't allow it. And then sin will stand out to you so it will, reek with, it will reek with its iniquity. It will not cause you to reject a person. It will cause you to have great compassion. Hmm? But I'm going to tell you what it will also cause you. To know that you can strip that devil naked right there on the spot and cast him out. Huh? And when I say strip it naked, expose it. Are you listening to me? But if you're brought under bondage of it, you, know, you can't even hardly sense it's there. You just, you justify it and say, well, you know, huh? You know, we all there. Is Jesus is there? Well, then it can't be us all. Holy Ghost is there? Then it can't be us all. We have to redefine that. <laughs> we, we all not there. <laughs> Who shall ascend into the mountain of the Lord? Who shall stand in this holy place? Uh, clean hands, pure heart. Has not lifted a soul up to vanity. And I tell you, there's a lot of vanity going on right now. The car we drive, the clothes we wear, our fame, our fortune, what people think about us. I'm trying to get to that verse of Scripture because Paul says, they glory in their position and not in their hearts. Let's see. Huh? I'm going to go ahead and finish reading this. I know I'm running late today, but we just got this family time. Huh? The lost aren't here today. Just, you know, we're just here. It's just the, some, of the, some of the core team. And I hope you're going to sign up because God's going to hold you responsible for this day in this service. And you can say, oh, well, I had, I, had, I had to go take care of this and that. I had land that I'd take care of. A new oxen I needed to prove. I got mm, this. A uh, wife I'm going to marry or whatever. Surfboards have got to shape the patients are needed to turn to lawsuits to conclude. Whatever. Dishes to wash. 
God knows I'm, my laundry is stacked to the ceiling and I don't have time. I'm busy with one child. <laughs> Miss Wesley raised Holy Ghost children, 19 of them, because she put Jesus first. It was a model, an example, serving God. She didn't say, oh, I got 19 children, I got an excuse, I don't need to come to the meeting. I'm busy. Come on, listen to me. I'm going to get after you. Hallelujah. Now, God himself has brought for us, has brought this about for us. Hallelujah. And has given us the spirit as a pledge. Can I say this? God has given to us proof that this resurrected, glorified body is ours. By the Holy Ghost, he's given to us. It's the proof. Every time I stukula mani de beti talama, I'm proving that I got the resurrected body coming to me. It's already wrought for me. It's wrought for me. Coming to me. Don't possess it. Coming to me. Wanting it. Every time I do those things that belong to the Holy Ghost, there's a manifestation of the Holy Ghost. There's a revelation of the Holy Spirit. Love, joy, peace, any activity of the Holy Ghost, longing to do the will of the Father, the activities of the Holy Ghost, saying, I hate sin, I'm not having anything to do with the longings of the activities of the Holy Spirit. It's proof. The Holy Ghost, every activity of the Holy Spirit. And I love the initial one. Hallelujah. Because that defines in Paul's definition what it meant to receive the Holy Spirit and to have the activity of the Holy Spirit. It's true. It's true. What you living for? Your bank account will mean nothing to you on that day. One second. In fact, if it is, the whole day and weeks leading up to your death, your money means nothing to you. All that's going through your mind, all that's going through your thoughts is how you've lived your life. It's all that's going through you. How you've, and it, how you've lived your life. And if you've been a Christian, it's how you've lived your life for Jesus. I tell you, you cannot run the risk of being there in that day and thinking that you could have done more. You hear me? Don't let my voice be a haunt to you on that day. Um, let, let, let this word of the Lord be to you an assurance. We therefore have good courage to know that being at home in the body, we are away from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. But we are confident and also take great delight in taking leave of the body. Do you take great delight in taking leave of the body? We, we take great delight in taking leave of the body. <laughs> Hallelujah. To take up residence with the Lord. Hallelujah. You take great delight in... Is everybody here take great delight in taking leave of the body yeah. so that you may take up residence with the Lord? Yeah. That's living for Jesus. Yeah. I surrender all now is happening here, okay? Living for this purpose, this divine purpose is a reality. Satan can't get in here. Satan can't get in here. He can't put a false identity on you when you've got this identity. Huh? He can't stop you when you've got this kind of relationship. Huh? Therefore, verse 9, we labor that whether we are home or, or we... Or we leave, we may be well pleased in him. Home, here in the body. Or leave, go be with him. And we have a great confidence, you know, ultimately, that when we leave here, we're going to be with him. Okay? <laughs> that whether we're at home, here, or there, we're pleasing to him. Because listen to this next verse of Scripture. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things that, that are done whether good or bad, according to that which was done in the body. We all must appear before the judgment seat of Christ to give an account for the things which we have done. And Paul's going to bring this thing to a conclusion. And, and, and I just want to say how he brings it to a conclusion. He, he brings us to a conclusion saying, knowing these things, knowing the terror of the Lord... We are attempting to persuade men. And I know how big of a challenge that is. We are attempting to persuade men. 
knowing the terror of the Lord. He says this, verse 14. We thus judge. If one died for all, then all of us are dead. It is actually a mistranslation to say all of us were dead because it is actually the present in tense in the, lang in the Greek language. We, or forgive me, past tense in the, in the Greek language. Forgive me, I got it right. Present tense. We are all dead. So that... And then verse 15 clears it up. We don't live for ourselves anymore. Are you ready to give an account for the deeds that are done in your body, whether they're good or bad? Because it's going to be on the basis of whether you live for yourself or live for Him. And what's really brought out on that in living for Him, we're living to be there where He is. That is our passion. That is the fruit then that we're not living unto ourselves. We're not, we're not finding our, our purpose and our identity here. Knowing the terror of the Lord, we thus persuade men. For if one died for all, then all are dead. That we should no longer live unto ourselves, but unto him who died for us and rose again. And then he brings it to a full conclusion in verse 17. And he said, and if anybody is in Christ Jesus... He's a new creature. Old things have passed away and all things have been made. Have been made. Not just become. Have been made new. And he's now, and verse 18 says, and all things about our life belongs to God. Is of God. He, he makes the point earlier. He says, now, we know no man after the flesh anymore. Even though we once knew Christ after the flesh, now we know no one after the flesh. Why? We this new creation. <laughs> we, we, we find a whole new identity, a whole new purpose, a whole new realm of life. We're not limited to a human realm of, of thinking. We're not limited to a human framework or reference point of ability because you can heal nobody. You can speak no life, cast out no devils, pre proclaim no liberty, do no works of Jesus after that realm. We don't know anybody after that realm anymore. We know everybody after the heavenly realm, after the realm of the spirit, after who we are now as new creation, all things are of God. And he has committed unto us the ministry of reconciliation. Verse 18. What is that? He's committed, we, we committed unto us this ministry of change. You change. Here's the power of change. Here's the cha He's been talking about change. Change from the earthly to the heavenly. He's been talking about being saturated and captivated by this divine working of God's grace. And now he tells us uh, another level. We're going to now, we're committed this, we're given this ministry that has been committed unto us to proclaim and pronounce change. Knowing that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself. Not counting their sin. Because if God would have counted sin, it would not have been God committing his love. It would have been what he did in, in Genesis chapter 6. Destroying the workers of iniquity. For the wrath of God is there on every every form of sin and every worker of iniquity. The wrath of God abides there. He didn't count our sins at the moment that he said, I'm going to send my only begotten son to redeem you. Recognizing that God was in the world. God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself. And has committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Ministry of reconciliation, verse 18. Word of reconciliation, verse 19. So that now we are the ambassadors of Christ. I stand in his place. You stand in his place. Every person, everybody in the body of Christ is called into this realm to stand in his place as ambassadors. 
of heaven. Beseeching people. Be reconciled to God. I love how Brother Yun does it. He commands people, fall down on your knees and repent right now. But with authority that he's received from Christ Jesus. And when he speaks it, and others in the Chinese church speak it, a great power of trembling and Holy Ghost conviction comes upon people. But what happened is they found upon their knees in prayer a divine grace that has already been given that cannot be connected with till the heart communes. Listen to me. Listen to me. Please do you listen. I, I challenge you. Read. Read the life of Father Nash. Father Nash... was a preacher of a very small church in upstate New York. Never grew to be more than 20, 30 people. One day, he built the church. He raised it up. One day, the people decided, we don't want you to be our pastor anymore. We want a younger man to move in and take up residence. And being rejected and cast out from his church... He went about doing the work of an evangelist. One day he hooked up with a guy named Charles Finney. Charles Finney said, I do the preaching, but Father Nash does the praying. And when he goes, and I send it, Father Nash, Charles Finney sent Father Nash in ahead of him. Two weeks ahead of him, just to begin to pray. He'd pray night and day. He found a place of prayer that he did not need to sleep. Read about him. Didn't need to sleep. And when the power of God, when he prayed, pray, pray, the power of God down upon cities and regions, and that was the great revival of Charles Finney. Read about a man who literally was named praying John Hyde. He was given a first name by, by not only the church, but the secular world, praying John Hyde. He exploded the nation of India and opened up a nation to receive the gospel message by calling down the fire of God upon the nation through prayer. Few, no such labor. Pop Seymour, people would go visit Pop Seymour. He'd write him, invite him in for a pr- to, hey, let's just pray a little while. Eight hours later. They didn't understand what was going on with this man. Doesn't matter where you go, that's what you're going to find. You find somebody who knows walk, has a walk with God, they've been led to a place of prayer. You want to see where God changes nations, you'll find a man who took hold of prayer in God. George Whitfield's another champion. He said that when George Whitfield, when he died, his knees were like flattened out, and like camel's knees. He spent so much time on his knees. A man, he got up from his prayer. And nations were shaken by the power of God. Getting people to come to prayer and understand prayer today is a challenge. Somebody said it's like pulling teeth from a chicken that just don't have any. It's a futile effort. Oh, but what happens when there's an identity shift? Purpose shift. All of a sudden, when you recognize, wait a minute, something happened. I'm dead. I no longer have a life for myself. I've been bought with a price. He purchased me. We reckon if he died for all, then all are currently dead. We don't exist outside of him. We live in him. Hallelujah. That we should henceforth no longer live to ourselves. Can I get it? Can you get it? Can I get it with you? Huh? And I tell you, I'm so blessed by this church because the majority of you, if we call for something to come, to come and do something, you come. You're there. You're laboring. Most every one of you are in the school of evangelism. Most every one of you are in the school of missions. Most every one of you in the school of spirit. I mean, just there. Good. God will meet us there. We will not let up. There's a, there's a plot. This is Jesus. This is why men ought to pray always and not faint. Consider the widow. Luke 18. I'm there. Father, I thank you that you hear my petition. I thank you, Father, that you set everything in order so that we can shake nations. 
I mean, I, I, I think the Lord let me go shake nations other outside of America so I could be built up in faith because I'm like, Father, can these dead bones live? Well, well, but well, so we get, a, we get a great harvest. Where do we bring them? Where do we bring them? What, am we gonna, am I going to bring them, set them down in, in a bunch of strife and, 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 and seditions and evil speaking and, 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 and huh? And bad conversation and slander and talking one against his neighbor? No. No. So what do we do? The father said, call fire down. Preach hard. Preach hard. Get up in its face and be relentless till it breaks. Amen. Amen. Command it to go. Uh, that's what he told me to do. Command it to go. I said it's an evil spirit. What I tell you to do is unclean spirits. Now I was with the Lord just praying, Father, what is the key? I'm crying out, what is the key? It's about 20 years ago. What is the key? Show me the key. Every scripture I opened to, and he gave him authority against unclean spirits. And he gave him authority against unclean spirits. And he cast out the unclean spirits. I mean, just recognizing that taking authority over those powers of darkness was number one to see the manifestation of the miracle and the breakthrough of heaven. And I said, well, what do I do about these people who were not here? I told you what to do. Cast out the unclean spirit. Confront it. Command it. Go. And you say, well, somebody's, he's talking bad about me. He doesn't like me. Love you. Don't like your baggage. <laughs> Don't like who you're hanging out with. You know what I'm saying? In Jesus' name, you walk around in that divine authority. Everybody's going to be blessed. You walk into a house. How many are going to do this with us? You can go from house to house. Hallelujah. How about Katana Nation? Hmm? I'm going to write you out a script. So you memorize, understand what to do. When you get there, this is what you're going to do. Is there any sick people in the house? Is there anybody not sleeping well at night? Anybody dealing with depression here? Fear and torment. person heard just recently that I had authority over demon spirits. They live in this community. They won't bring their child to me. I have to be out of town this week. They want to bring their child to me as soon as they get back. They don't know Jesus, but they want me to cast the devil out of them. And that's quite amazing that in a Western society, in an affluent neighborhood, somebody would actually recognize Mental insanity is a demon power. I said, be happy to. I mean, you can put them on the phone right now and do it over the phone. James, stand up. Stand up, James. James was, uh, James was going to commit suicide. He called my daughter on the phone. My daughter on the phone said, you foul spirit. I command you go now. Set him free. He's been walking with the Lord ever since. Amen. Amen. I have the phone. I don't have the phone. I don't have the phone. Praise God. We would say all they want to say about, my, you know, the way we do things. Somebody said we're controlling. Yeah. We're controlling every demon spirit commanding it to go. <laughs> Amen. Huh? And we can, hallelujah. Uh -huh. we're, we're, we're saying that there's not going to be anything that is displeasing to God in our life, Amen. in our family, in our association. Amen. Huh? Hallelujah. Somebody tried to give my son a rundown the other day and said, well, you know, you, all you, you, all, you, all, you just obey your dad, whatever he says you do. And that's just a big, gigantic compliment. That's all there is to it. <laughs> and the person is supposedly Christian, as though there's something wrong with that. My goodness, people's minds are warped. With iniquity. And praise God, he does. He does everything I saw him do. Always has been perfect son. Why? Because when it comes to rebellion, I'm mean. When it comes to opposition, I'm a terror. Hmm? We just don't allow it. Lots of love, though. Lots of love. Just no compromise. 
people have problems in their homes because they compromise. They compromise with rebellion, disobedience. They compromise with dissension. Mm. The argument. They compromise. All right, we don't have any arguments. We're not arguing. Amen. Good. And of course, the wife holds the key to that. My wife's full of the Holy Ghost. That's why she doesn't argue. If she wasn't full of the Holy Ghost, she'd argue all the time. If she was full of religion, she'd be the most argumentative person around. Huh? She's full of the Holy Ghost. That's why she never argues. Huh? Is that amazing or what? Women, am I talking to you? Yeah. Am I messing with your program right now? Hallelujah. Uh, you know what? I don't argue with Jesus. I just don't argue with him, you know? He's Lord. I don't argue with the Father. I don't tell Father, this is what you need to be doing. He knows good and well what he needs to be doing. I need to understand what I need to be doing. Father, what do I, thy will be done. Huh? Jesus never did his own will either. No, he, didn't. he just did what Papa said. Only what Papa said. That's it. That's it. Amen. And he's got the model son-father relationship. Yes. Praise God. Isn't that good? Yes. It is good. Now I'm going to say the last verse of Scripture. Because you know, I, I didn't get all the verses of Scripture, first, Second Corinthians chapter 5, but let me give you the last verse of Scripture. And he who knew no sin, and Christ Jesus, who never himself sinned. He who knew no sin. Because he never sinned, he could become the sin offering. He who knew no sin became the sin offering for you and me. So that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Wow. That's kind of change. That's kind of change here. That's kind of heaven, that's kind of heavenly realm. You know, there's just no place. We're not allowing any place for the enemy to say he's got any rights over me. None. He ain't got any rights over me. None. Huh? Let me tell you something. Everybody I know who went to inner healing 25 years ago, still in it. <laughs> I'm tell you what. 25 years from now, they'll still be in it. You know why? There's no power to change them there. It's not the Word of God. It's changed by the Spirit. Amen. Washed in the blood. Amen. That's the only faith to change men. Yeah. Yeah. Hallelujah. Listen to me. Basta kuda mestatila. Bambletati takana sati yipete. I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to change. I command you in the name of Jesus Christ. Get the stuff out of your life that's not supposed to be in it. Yes. Clean your house up. Yes. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Amen. Brosoki taya. Commit yourself to the Lord Jesus Christ. Consecrate yourself to Him. Hallelujah. Begin to walk out this wonderful walk. Hallelujah. Hoo hoo hoo. You know, it's really hard to preach on 2 Corinthians chapter 5 because you didn't preach on 1 Corinthians. You didn't go ahead and give the context of chapter 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 4, and 1, 2, 3, and 4. And of course, the context of chapter 3 is radical. We're living epistles of Christ, read of men, written of God. God wrote out his ways upon us, not on tables of stone, but on the fleshly tables of the heart. That's chapter 3. I don't want to review 1 and 2. Take up too much time. Whew. It said now with, uh, chapter 3 ends with, now with unveiled faces, we behold as in a mirror the glory. What glory? His glory. That's verse 18. And are changed. Reconciled. Katalege. Changed. Hmm. Chapter 4, Paul says, one of the most radical statements he made, Jesus is manifested in my mortal flesh. Radicals. Paul, what on earth was going on in your life, man? What did you know that we don't know? No, it's while he believed that we are unwilling to believe. Because he wrote down what he knew. And we've all, most of us have read it. We're inviting you into a realm of divine glory that you can't even begin to imagine. And it don't stop, start after you die. It starts before you die if you want it to go on after you yeah, die. That's good. Yeah. Let me tell you what I've seen. Let me tell you what I've seen in my life. Even in recent 
in the past week. I see people slandering other people and justifying themselves in doing it and calling themselves baptized in the Holy Ghost. You know what? It's proof to me that there's iniquity in their life. They're snared by the devil and they're not right with God. And then, because they've justified it, they won't repent. Right. So they're snared by the devil, marked by sin. Mm. Mercy. And have no ears to hear when you try to talk to them about wrongdoing. Mm. You talk about getting neutralized by saying, you talk about what's really going on in the midst of the church. Why isn't the church more effective? Because there's a lot of stuff. The Lord Jesus will forgive us. Over and over and over again, he's provided mercy and cleansing for his blood. With his blood. But we have to be willing to walk in the light as he's in the light. We're going to have to be willing to walk in the truth. We're going to have to be willing to walk in obedience. We're going to have to be willing to say, okay, Lord, I know I'm not supposed to be taking up an offense against anyone. I'm not supposed to be slandering anyone. I'm not supposed to be talking bad about anyone. I know that there can't be strife in my life. I can't have... Finger pointing and accusations. People just run their mouth. Just the Lord says, the Lord pinpoints it. He says, guile, evil speaking. Father's face is against you. It said it in Psalms, the Old Testament, it said it in the New Testament, first Peter chapter two. That's what he said. People want to say whatever they want to say. You're not making heaven. You're not making heaven. Guile only lives. Evil in your tongue? The Lord says, his face is against you. His ears are open to the prayers of the righteous. Those are the people who pursue peace in relationship. Huh? Not accounting people's sins, but reaching out to them, no matter what they've done. We're reaching out to you. We're just loving on you. Huh? We love them. We never cut anybody off. God never cuts anybody off. God never cut. We never cut anybody off. Everybody knows my manner of life. And how I've lived my life for 30 years in this city. Never cut anybody off. Never slammed the door on anyone. Ever. My heart's open. Come, let's come. Let's reason together. Come, let's get this right. I've dealt with people where other ministers come along and say, you know what? You should throw them out of the church. Why do you deal with these people? Why do you let that sedition go on? Well, because the Lord, I hear what you're saying, but the, as the pastor, the Lord hasn't told me to do that. She says, continue to deal with them because there's other mitigating circumstances, collateral damage around them. Sometimes the Lord says, let the tear grow with the wheat. For in plucking up the tear, you should pluck up the wheat also. What's sad is to know the tares. And you, you generally speak to them. You cry out. You generally speak. They will not convert. It's almost made me believe in some people appointed under wrath. Because I'm, I know the authority of the Word of God. It's just deception. Where you want to just reach in, I won't take the tear up. I'm taking out the tear. No, can't touch it. You pull, you'll pull up the wheat, mitigating circumstances. Collateral damage, you'll pull up the wheat also. Better examine your heart. Just better examine your heart. I'm just telling you, people, the power of the living God is about to be poured out in an unprecedented way upon the nations of the earth. Yes. This I know. True. I know this. Amen. I was talking to one man of God about, I don't know, I probably was somewhere around 15 years ago. He was the leader of the Smithton Revival. It was called the Smithton Revival. Brother Gray. He was with us couple of days ministering in the church. And I said, you know, and, and I recognized in the power and the glory of God that had been being manifested in the meetings and what the Lord was showing him. I said, bro, I said, when is it that we see this multiplicity of ministry kick in in the church so the glorious church can be seen? He said, the Lord's going to be merciful for a time because when that happens, people are going to fall down, down dead. Because God won't allow. In his mercy, he, was holds, he holds himself back. 
He holds his glory. He holds his manifest glory back. Because if he comes, if he comes with his glory, and then people start lying to the Holy Ghost and start doing things that violate his divine order, go read. Go read. I'm going to willingly get my heart into a place of agreement with the Holy Spirit, my attitude, my thinking, so the Father can be free to do everything He wants to do in my life. In many respects, it's like Father's asking us for permission. Can I use you? Can I bless you? Can I give you all that I have for you? And then He examines our heart because now we get ourselves in a conflict. How are we going to act? Are we going to act like Matthew 5, 6, and 7? Are we going to act like hell? Are you going to do the, you're going to do the deeds of one father or the other. Jesus said to the Pharisees, the religious Pharisees, you do the deeds of your father, the devil. What you see him do, you, it's what you're doing. The Lord actually took me one day in a dream and showed me how that works. I went into a place watching angels of darkness do their thing that became then emulated. The same dress, same behavior, same sp speech, everything in the earth, in, in the realms of men. John 8 came alive to me. The, the deeds of your father, you do them. I, she said, I do the deeds of my father. You and I, we have a, we have a challenge. Are we going to be conformed to the image of the sun? You and I, we have a challenge. Is your life right now more important to you than the life hereafter? Are you groaning about stuff now rather than things later? Huh? Is your earthly care more important to you than the heavenly riches? You're going to have to deal with this, people, because it reveals the state of your heart. We're talking to you. Talking to you on YouTube right now. Listen to me. God loves you so much. He did no sin. Came here, took upon the robes of the servant. Did not sin so that he could offer himself. It's a sin offering for your sake so you could be righteous just like he's righteous. That's the gospel message. So that you can have a home in heaven. Hallelujah. An eternal dwelling in the presence of the Lord. I consecrate myself this day to serve God with all my heart, my soul, my mind, my strength. I call you as a minister of reconciliation, ambassador of Christ this day. Turn from your own way. Serve the Lord with all your heart. With all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. In Jesus' name, come. Don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed or transfigured, hallelujah, by the renewing of your mind considering these things. Praise God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. One day, death would try to come and claim you. And you need the seal of the Holy Ghost that says you have no right here. Every time I say no to sin, I'm saying to the spirit of death that would come and take me and claim me, you have no right here. Every time temptation comes, I say, you foul spirit of hell, I bind you now, I cast you down now. Huh? Because I want to look at people's lives and say, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, go free. And if sin brings me into bondage, bondage, I have no authority. It has authority over me. That which a man has overcome, the same as he brought under the authority of it. There's a revival. There's a revival taking place in the midst of the church right now. It's happening. Fires of revival are burning so that a great awakening can come. Fires of revival are burning so a great awakening can come. Yes. Fires of revival are burning, so a great awakening. Thank you. Fires of revival are burning, so a great awakening. You agree for all eternity. Somebody said, is it fire? Yeah. But that's not the hell of it. Is it dark? Yeah. But that's not the hell of it. The hell of it is knowing that you refused the great opportunity of ruling and reigning with Jesus throughout the ages. That's the hell of it. The hell of it is where you have to look 
at the demonic lie that enticed you to its pleasure every day and you rejected the treasure of his divine presence and glory. Every day you took your wills to the Father's will. When he had life for you, you chose death. When he had blessings, you chose curses. Now I know the Lord's talking to a few people in this place today. He's talking to people that are listening by the web right now. On YouTube. Christ Jesus loves you. He's proved it. He died for you. You have an opportunity to come. Surrender your life to him. He gives it to you right now, no matter where you're at. If you're in a prison right now, in a jail cell, you can't get out. Right there. You don't need anyone else. Christ Jesus is there. If you're in your living room, Christ Jesus is there. God's calling you. Driving down the car, listen to this on the radio. On, he's there. Right there. Calling you. All you have to do is come. You say, well, I'm going to get myself, I need to clean myself up and be better. And then I'll come. You know, nothing's ever going to change. You can't be better. He came reconciling the world, not counting your sin. He comes to you right now to reconcile you, not counting your sin. Only He can change you. Only He can change you. Let Him change you now. Next Sunday, this place is going to be packed with the lost. Amen. And if, and if you live for yourself, if any of you come in here and you live for yourself, when around you are souls weigh in the balance and you all frown and downcast and just caught up in circumstance, my goodness gracious, what you do to hurt them. No, you need to get full of the Holy Ghost between now and then. Amen. Well, you're just there, you there interceding. You don't even have to look at them. You're just there interceding. And just because they, you don't even have to say nothing. Just your life is in such an anointing so powerful on you. Demons get within 30 feet of you. They're taking out. They're taking out. Taking out. Watch what happens, man. You come out of prayer, come out of prayer, conversation with the Lord, you walk in, try to buy some groceries, people break out in cold sweat, start trembling, shaking. I had a guy trying to write out my invoice. He starts, big man, starts sweating, shaking, trembling. And he's, 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 he looks up at me, he goes, excuse me, I don't know what's wrong with me. <laughs> Sir, I know what's wrong with you. Christ Jesus is calling you right now. Claim a hell that's been upon you is broken now in Jesus' name. They either going to break down and cry or they're going to run. So you can't do that here. Well, I'm believing God that, that uh, come on. Prayer does that. Prayer does that. School of Evangelism is going to be saturated with prayer. You want to understand the key? Go read about Pray and Hyde of India. Pray and John Hyde of India. Go read about John Nash. Go read about George Whitfield. I've been reading about these men for 30 years. They always had inspiration to me. I got every complete work of prayer that you can name. I'm going to put it up there in a the library too. So people can come read. You begin to read about these men. Your heart begins to burn with fires from off the coal of God's altar. If you fall to your knees, as I did, the spirit of prayer come upon you. The spirit of prayer and supplication come upon you. Hallelujah. Change, change, change around you. Yes. Things change. God prepare you unto every good work. I want you to, I want you to sing this song. Take all of me. I want you to stand with me. I want every one of you to sing the song with us. Take all of me, Lord. Here 
Follow you. I will follow you. I will follow you, Lord Jesus. Oh, I will follow. I want to invite you to come for prayer. You have any need in your life. You have a spiritual need. If you've never accepted Christ Jesus, if you've never been changed by the power of God, come and pray for you. God will touch you and change you right now. If you have physical problems in your body, you've got sickness or disease in your body, come right now. The Lord will touch you, change you. he heal you. Even if you have financial problems, the Lord is concerned about the financial situation of your life. The most important thing is your salvation. The most important thing is that you're right with God, that you've been made a new creation. We can see people get healed of every kind of disease and they can die and go to hell. Oh. In body. But the most important thing is that you become whole in spirit. If there are strongholds, if you can recognize strongholds, somebody says, what is a stronghold? It's a reoccurring problem. It's a reoccurring sin. It's a reoccurring failure. Christ Jesus is here to break that thing off of you and convince you that it has no power over you ever again. The Lord wants you to live an abundant life. He's given you the life that He Himself has. What a life! What a life! What a glorious life! How could we anybody has have, who has any possible clue of having the life of God versus their life turn away? Only by the power of deception. Because the life that God has for us is whew, joy unspeakable, full of glory, peace that passes, understanding. Love that goes beyond all knowledge. Life forevermore. Comfort, protection, peace, goodness. Everything that pertains to life and godliness. Why don't you make a decision that this day Christ Jesus is going to be your God and will be the one you follow instead of you following the imaginations of your own mind. 
Which reality of it is just following the powers of darkness, following Satan. Decide who you're going to follow because I'm going to tell you right now. I'm laying it out for you. You're either following Christ Jesus or you're following Satan. You're either under the influence of the Holy Ghost or you're the influence of demonic spirits. It's just that simple. Who will you serve? It's that simple. As for me and my house, we're going to follow Christ Jesus. He's King of kings and Lord of lords. And we're going to rule. We're going to rule under him. I'm going to rule effectively. He's going to come and he's going to rule with a rod of iron and he's going to bring down every rebellion. He's going to bring down every opposition. He's going to bring down every authority. He's going to bust it. As a, as, listen to me. Listen. To, talk about authority. He will shatter it as a, as, a, as a potter shatters a vessel. What is it that you need? Uh, I just came up here because my husband was up here. That is a but very it, good point. <laughs> Adam walked up to somebody just the other day and he said, Excuse me, sir. Do you have a minute? I don't mean to interrupt you, but do you, do you have a minute? Can I just talk to you? Oh, absolutely. What, what, do, you, what do you need, young man? Has anyone ever told you about the gospel of Jesus? The guy says, I hate you. <laughs> and that's the way it works many times. He went from being all sweet and friendly as soon as Jesus' name comes down. But watch what happens now. Watch what happens. Father's going to glorify the name of His only begotten Son. You watch what happens. God's going to glorify the name of Jesus Christ in Japan. Father's going to glorify the name. I'm on a mission for Japan. I tell you right now. I've... I got back and I started talking to all of my evangelist friends about Japan that have great ministries around the world. And they've been to Japan. And before I started telling them, they said, oh, yeah, Japan's messed up. Spiritually, it's messed up. <laughs> you know, there's like, and they started giving me the statistics. Oh, yeah, there's like about 30 of the churches in Tokyo, about probably 2,000 churches around there. I mean, I'm going, well, why is somebody doing something about this program? What are we going to do? What are we going to do? Lord Jesus, what are we going to do about Japan? What are we going to do? Father, how is the breakthrough going to come from that nation? Just takes one, one person living valiantly for him. One. Fire of God upon your life right now in Jesus' name. Right now in the name of Jesus. Yeah, that's it. Now, everything changes about your life. Everything changes. Everything changes. Everything changes about your life. Everything changes about your life. In Jesus' name. Satan has no rights over those who put their trust in Christ Jesus. None. What is it that you need? Father, we pray in the name of Jesus that Leslie's son, Jonathan, where is he at right now? Where is he going to school? Where is he going to school? In, in Salt Lake City is a tough place to get the gospel and radical for Jesus. But, Father, we, you can do all things are possible with, for you, even in Salt Lake City, Utah. Father, we pray right now, send you words, send you fire upon this family. Lord, you, you are the one that hears and answers our prayer and harks into our voice. Now, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, Father, I thank you for taking Leslie and make a fiery evangelist out of her in Jesus' name. I command her son, come into the kingdom. Touched by the power of God. Whatever it takes. Whatever it takes. Everybody, I want you, I want you to grab a hold of that one glorious prayer that praying John Hyde prayed for India. Give me souls or I will die. It was the agony of his soul. He was so filled with the compassion of Jesus 
you see. It wasn't legalism, it wasn't religious. He was so filled with the compassion of Jesus. He had so touched the heart of God by yielding to the Holy Ghost that he was so, he so, was so desperate to see men's souls saved that he was at the point of death. He was so filled with this love of God. Give me souls or I'm going to die from this heartache for the lost. And I'm going to tell you right now, that begins because you obey. You begin to step out. And you begin to go reach the lost. You go, begin to go lay down your life. Lay down your reputation. Be willing to be rejected and persecuted. And as you do, the, the, the compassions of God fill you for the lost. At the same time, faith and authority fills you to see them transformed. Hallelujah. I just, we, we had some wonderful stuff happen over Christmas. I took my kids to six nursing homes. And uh, <laughs> I'm not kidding. I'm getting overwhelmed here. I'm just like, I just, we went to six nursing homes. And uh, I just told the people, we're just going to sing songs and, and tell the Christmas story. And that's what we did. We, I just read from the book of, from the book of Luke. Uh, one and two, and uh, and uh, and and all these people, five homes got touched. I went to four homes on Friday, and on the third home, I, I just did the same thing. You guys can do the same thing I did, and uh, I just uh, I just I read from the book of Luke, and we we alternated songs, you know, and and Hezekiah did Psalm twenty three and. We did the blessing of Joseph and stuff that I've taught the kids, and they have memorized, you know, just kind of break it up so I'm not just reading it all straight through, right? And, uh, and then, and uh, so we had a lot of cool stuff happen, but the third home we went to on Friday, it was just this little home, and, uh, and it, was just, it was just a house, and there were three ladies, and, and they took us into this room, and this lady was here. Her name was Jeannie, and she was in a bed, and they had her hooked up to a machine, and, uh, you know, whatever the machine was, I think it was oxygen, but it was running the whole time, you know, and I had to keep my eyes on Abraham, because, you know, it's a pretty fascinating little machine going on there, and uh, nevertheless, nevertheless, uh, I didn't want him to switch a button, you know, turn the thing off or something, but at any rate... So, so at any rate, I told the story, and here's the story. I told the same story every time. I said, you know, I, I went through the book of Luke, and then I, I talked about, you know, uh, John 3, how, how you need to be born of the Spirit. And I told about the lady that I worked for who was 68 years old, and, and I cut her trees, and she was dragon brush the whole time. And she kept apologizing and saying how, how, uh, how sorry she was that she couldn't keep up with me. And I told her, lady... You're, you're working harder than some of the 20-year-old men that I've had work for me. And at any rate, at the end of the day, so 68 years old, at the end of the day, at the end of the day, I, I told her, you know, how to be born again. And she'd been in church her entire life. She'd been in church her entire life. She went to a Billy Graham crusade. And the people that she went with thought it was scandalous to be at, at the crusade. And so she wanted to go forward when he made the altar call, and they, they stopped her from going. And so uh, that day, at 68 years old, at the end of, at, at the end of working with her, I, I told her how to get born again, and she was born again at 68. And she was, like, so happy. That is beautiful. And, and so I, I, I told the same story to all these people because we got all these old people, you know. And, and, and some of them are really old. And, and so... I was telling this story, and, 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 and I said, hey, you've been, you know, she got born again that day. And so then I, I did the same thing at every place. I said, is there anyone that would like to be born again? And so at this house, this lady, Jeannie, she was overjoyed. She's all, me, 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 me. 
I mean, she's laid out in her bed. I, I saw her reaching for her, her water at one point. And this is how she was. She couldn't do it. But you know what? She was like overjoyed. And she goes, me, me, me. And so I prayed with her right there. And she got born again. That is beautiful, man. <laughs> this lady. <Woo! laughs> and so... Uh, you know, that was the best experience. I prayed with many people, and, you know, and I just, you know, as I was in there, I, I just said, you know, I prayed, I said it over and over again, because, you know, even the people who didn't know what was going on, and this was, you know, you know, new to them or whatever, I wanted them to hear it over and over again, so I just said, you confess with your mouth, this is, it's simple, you, you believe in your heart that Jesus is Lord, and, and confess with your mouth that God raised him from the dead. And I said it over and over again every time. And so I did it not just as a salvation. I know that we, we say it as like a conclusion thing. Okay, now everybody come forward. But I, I planted it as a seed also, just so those people could go home and they've heard it several times, you know. or, or they, I would go home. They're still there. But, uh, but uh, just as a seed so they could do it. You know, if they went to bed that night or whatever, you know, they would have it, that seed, how to get saved, you know. And these people are just, they're on their deathbed, and they were so, most of the places were so overjoyed. I went to the, the sixth house, though, and uh, we came in, and they had a birthday party, and this guy was playing his guitar and, you know, just singing Yankee Doodle Dandy and rock and roll songs, all kinds of different stuff. And, uh, and uh, so then we were up after him, and so then he was, like, cleaning up his stuff, and we started, and I was telling the Luke story. I told all the people the same thing. I said, we're going to tell the Christmas story, and we're going to sing carols, you know? And, uh, and so then halfway through, I was almost at the end of Luke, you know? And, and this guy had cleaned up his stuff, and he came over to me and says, uh, could you step outside for a minute? I want to talk to you. And so I went outside, and the guy rebuked me. He said, hey, you know what? these people didn't want you to come in here and bring your propaganda and all this stuff. And, you know, they're not, they're not going to tell you, but I am. And I said, did, did they tell you to tell me this? And, they say, and he said, yes. And so I go, whoa, you know. And so um, I said, okay, you know, whatever. And so then I, he left. I went back inside, you know. So I was a little bit flustered for a minute. But I looked, you know, and we've got 30 people in wheelchairs, and this could be their last day. This is their opportunity. And I came to tell, teach them the gospel. And so I did it. I, you know, I, like I said, I was like, for about 30 seconds, I was going, what do I do? And I kind of fumbled a little bit. But, you know, as I got to looking at those people, you know, I, I, I strengthened myself. And I said, I'm just going to do it. And so I told the exact same story. And the people were miffed. And they were pulling people out of their wheelchairs because there was only one person that wasn't in a wheelchair. So, uh... I did it anyway, and I prayed, for, <laughs> I prayed for the people that would let me pray for them. Yeah. That's beautiful, man. And that is, so, that's, the, that's, the, that's the gospel. <laughs> I just want to encourage you, you know, just something happened in my spirit, and I just said, you know, i got to take hold of these nursing homes. And just things that were coming to my memory that people had said. Um, you know, Debbie from Alaska that was with Rodney, you know, she said she started in the nursing homes. I didn't know, it just kept going resounding in my spirit so I did it you know and, and this is an awesome opportunity I, I love Christmas because you can people that won't say hi to you on the streets you can say Merry Christmas and they'll respond to you and be happy and so you can just bring that little bit of joy to people but we've got you know Passover Easter coming up too so maybe some of you guys start thinking because there's two times a year where people will go to church and you know and will receive the gospel even you know some of the religious people or whatever you know but nevertheless, you can, you can take advantage of that. So uh, I just want to share that. I'm just like, especially that lady, Jeannie is her name. You know, just to have her just go be so overjoyed at the whole thing. I want to be born again. I want to do that. And uh, so those people are out there waiting for us. Joseph, thank you so much for going on behalf of Christ Jesus in the church. Thank you so much. Thank you, Father, for the anointing. Touch right now in Jesus' name. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Touch right now in Jesus' name. Find a bunch of people, hug them, tell them that you love them, bless them in Jesus' name. Come back tonight. Bring people, find people that need to, heal, to be healed. 
People with sickness, diseases in their body, bring them. 